For today's prophecy update, I want to talk about how 2017 was arguably one of the most significant years in recent history, certainly prophetically, and I think you would uh, agree with me. At the beginning of the year, I made the assertion that the Trump presidency would rev up, I chose those words deliberately, the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. The reason I chose the words rev up is because of what Jesus said in Revelation chapter 20. He said, behold, I come quickly. And that's an interesting word in the original language of the Greek New Testament. It's the Greek word takos, where we get our uh, English word for tachometer. It's a measurement of revolutions per minute or RPMs. And what Jesus was saying here in effect was, behold, I come at a time when things are revving up. Things are speeding up. As I look back on this year, <laughs> what a year it's been, uh, one of the things that is striking to me is just how fast it went. I know we say that every year, but on God's prophetic calendar, it just seems like this was a profound prophetic year and just how swiftly everything happened. So now, well nigh a year later, it does seem that this is beginning to come to pass. And I believe it has profound implications for and in 2018. I spent some time this last week going over all that's happened in the last year, and in the interest of time, I've condensed it to what I see as four of the most significant prophetic developments of the year. And what's interesting about them is that they all interconnect, or perhaps better said, intersect like puzzle pieces, or, oh, thank you so much, God bless you. Ah. <laughs> going to have to do a, pardon me. I asked the Lord on the way here, I said, Lord, you know, as long as I can still talk, it's okay. You know, I don't even need to stand. I could sit on a stool, but just so I can just talk, just keep my voice. So anyway, that's Pardon me. Um, if you will, uh, imagine this picture in your mind. Bible prophecy is like a crossword puzzle. Everything connects and intersects. It's like pieces to a puzzle that all fit together perfectly as the picture comes together. I want to begin with this first one. And it's that of the unprecedented natural disasters that are increasing in both frequency and intensity. I realize that, and this is commonly what I'm uh, asked about in the comments that are uh, made, but haven't we always had earthquakes and natural disasters? Absolutely we have. But it's becoming irrefutable that Today, they are the likes of which we have never seen before in human history. The size and the scope of them, like birth pains, continue to intensify and they're more frequent. It's almost like here comes this major storm and then, oh my, we don't even catch our breath and there's another one. Oh, and then there's another one and then while that's happening, this is happening over here. On Tuesday, CNBC, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I hope it's I'm trying to make it not a distraction. 
CNBC published a report titled 2017, A Year of Disaster. Let me just quote briefly uh, from the report. 2017 was a devastating year with natural disasters such as catastrophic floods, wildfires, and earthquakes affecting millions across the globe. Sigma recently estimated that disasters this year caused an estimated 306 billion with a B dollars in total economic losses. And that's not to even mention the loss of life because of these storms, even as we speak, flooding. This, this fire in California, the worst in history, the worst in recorded history taking place as we speak. In Matthew's gospel, the 24th chapter, the disciples asked Jesus, what are going to be the signs of your return and of the end of the age? And in verse 4, Jesus answers this way. He says, watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming, I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And then he likens them in verse 8 to a woman in labor. And he says, all these are the beginning of birth pains. And what do we know to be true about birth pains? They come in greater frequency and in greater intensity. And certainly we're witnessing this take place in this, the last days. This ties into our second one as it relates to wars and rumors of wars, specifically concerning the geopolitical developments in Damascus, Syria. 2017 certainly brought about a massive shift surrounding who's in Syria and perhaps more importantly, why they're in Syria. If you were to ask me which Bible prophecy I thought was on the cusp of being fulfilled, it would have to be uh, the prophecy concerning Damascus, Syria in Isaiah 17 verse 1. Let me just read it. A prophecy against Damascus. See, Damascus will no longer be a city, but will become a heap of ruins. It's believed that in a day there will come sudden destruction upon Damascus that will be so uh, dis destructive that the city of Damascus will no longer be inhabitable. This has never happened before. Is Damascus a heap of ruins today? Yes, it is. But the worst is yet to come because something is going to happen. Some believe a strike at the hands of Israel, who already heretofore has uh, sent many missiles into specifically Damascus, where it's believed Bashar al-Assad has weapons of mass destruction, <laughs> key word, hidden beneath these hospitals and schools. And so it makes it very difficult, but all it takes is uh, one strike on one location in Damascus, and that city is completely destroyed, never to be in inhabited again. And I would suggest that everybody is now at the ready in Damascus, in Syria, exactly as we were told they would be. Now, someone might want to let the Russian president Vladimir Putin know about this Isaiah prophecy, because according to Al Arabiya, he told his Syrian counterpart, Bashar al-Assad, in a New Year's greeting that Russia will continue supporting Syria's efforts to defend its sovereignty. Now, this, again, 
like a crossword puzzle, connects and intersects with this third development. And it's that of the prophetic alignment of nations with Russia and Iran at the helm, uh, and now Turkey, uh, and more recently even Sudan, but especially and perhaps more interestingly, Saudi Arabia. In November of this year, we witnessed what some have dubbed a tectonic shift with Putin's so-called victory summit in Russia. Uh, this is where he met with both uh, Iran and Turkey, and this was historic in the sense that it had never happened before, and this alignment was and is very exciting for students and teachers of Bible prophecy because it's exactly what we were told would happen in Ezekiel over 2,500 years ago. And of course, I'm referring to Ezekiel 38, a prophecy that we've talked about often during the last year. I won't take the time to read it, but let me just give you the gist of it. I am going to just move forward with the presupposition that you know about this prophecy, but it's basically an alliance of Russia, Iran, Turkey, Sudan, in that area, a lot of the stands, as they're called, uh, Ethiopia, these Islamic nations under the lead of Russia and Iran will launch a nuclear attack against Israel and they'll do so to take a spoil. In other words, they want what Israel has. What does Israel have? Oh, they have spoil. Or as one said, just take the SP off and you have oil and they have natural gas and they have technology and they have prosperity and they have all of the above and that's what they want. And that's what we're told they're going to do in verse 13, where we also have a very fascinating detail in this prophecy about Sheba and Dedan, which is the modern day area we know today as Saudi Arabia. And here's what's interesting. They're not aligned with Russia, Iran, Turkey at all. They protest this allied attack. And in their protest with the merchants of Tarshish and all their young lions, they question in protest, asking, have you attacked because you want to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty or a spoil to carry away silver and gold to take away livestock and goods to take great plunder is that why the implication being is that Saudi Arabia is not a, only not aligned with Russia and Iran but actually it would seem that they're more on the side of Israel who knew? Who knew? On Monday, the Jerusalem Post published an article that <laughs> virtually reads like Ezekiel 38. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. The, uh, the uh, article is titled, Israel's future looks bright, save for the rising Iranian threat. Let me just uh, share a little bit about what they had to say. They talk about the movement of Saudi Arabia under the young crown prince Mohammed bin Salman toward Israel and how it's a major positive factor for Israel in facing Iran. Uh, is, is, that, is it just me or is that verse 13 of Ezekiel 38? They also talk about Israel's bright future economically. And they, they quote statistics. Here's one. Israel's GDP capita has soared from $3,000 in 1948 
to almost $39,000 in 2017. Here's another. Israel's foreign exchange reserves have soared from less than $1 billion in 1960, two years before I was born, to $100 billion. Let me just uh, repeat that. 1960, $1 billion. Today, $100 billion. A hundred times more today. Here's another one. Israel's high-tech industry is in the top five in the world and home to the R&D work of over, get this, 300 foreign companies. Oh, that's why they're interested. You know that Israel can make water, drinking water, out of air? How's that one? Well, you know that cell phone that's in your pocket that I hope you silenced or turned off? <laughs> you know the technology in that, that cell phone in our pockets? You know where it came from? It came from Israel. Time does not permit me to grocery list all of the things that comes out of Israel. And this... One of 300 companies, foreign companies, Mobileye, uh, was sold to Intel for 15 billion with a B dollars. Uh, Israel is very prosperous today, very prosperous today. They then go on to talk about how Israel's military is the most powerful in the Middle East, and truly it is. And among the top 10, in the world. It's reported to have nuclear weapons, ultra-modern missile defense systems, and first-class airplanes and pilots, and its intelligence forces are also among the best in the world. Did you know that? Well, here's their conclusion. <laughs> Overall then, the future seems bright save for the Iranian threat to someday use nuclear weapons against a country that has only some 20,000 square kilometers, 58% of which, that's over half, is desert. But then Israel has multiple strengths and Iran has serious problems at home and increasingly abroad. Uh, I don't know if you've uh, heard what's going on in Iran. We're four days into this. This is really interesting. I had to take a second look at uh, this this morning. It was on uh, Fox News. Uh, it's kind of interesting, the, the commentary. This is very different than the uh, protests in 2009. These Iranians, and by the way, let me preface this by uh, letting you know, I hope you know this, that Iranians are coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ by the multitudes. Did you know that? By the multitudes. They're, in the Middle East, Muslims are coming to Christ by the multitudes. And I praise God for that. Well, these Iranians are actually in their protests calling for the removal of the Islamic regime of the Ayatollah. They didn't ask for that in 2009. Well, now, wait a minute. Um, my Bible says that Iran is going to, with Russia and these other nations, attack Israel. So it doesn't make sense to me that they will succeed in toppling this Islamic regime. But now think about that. Is it possible now that the regime realizes the clock is ticking? When there's a revolution, they're actually calling for the son of the Shah Get this, I mean, <laughs> prior to 1979, 
and the overthrow of the Shah, Iran was Israel's friend. Can you even wrap your mind around that? I was 16 years old in 1979. I graduated uh, high school, barely, <laughs> not proud of that, but in 1980. And I remember it, even at a uh, young age. But uh, Israelis would actually go to Iran to vacation. On Thursday nights, we're uh, in the book of Esther. It is very, very interesting. One of the, one of my, <laughs> I know I say this about every book, but it's one of my favorite books in all of the Bible. It is so fascinating how God in his sovereignty orchestrated the circumstances using Esther and Mordechai to deliver his people, the Jewish people, from the hands of a, an antichrist type named Haman. And by the way, the typology in the book is just off the charts. And this is in the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire. And here we are today, fast forward. And by the way, it wasn't until the last century that they changed the name from Persia to Iran, and then in 1979 it became the Islamic Republic of Iran. And now the protesters four days in, without any real signs of it dissipating, are calling for the toppling of this Islamic regime. That could be a game changer. It certainly bears watching in the days ahead. I believe it has a profound prophetic implications. But it's really interesting because the protesters are prote protesting chiefly because of the economy in Iran. And Ynet News reported that they are urging their government to, of all things, let go of Palestine. It seems that Iranians are protesting Iran's costly involvement in regional conflicts and providing financial aid to Assad in Syria, Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Houthi rebels. While at home, the country suffers, pardon me, from an economic crisis. Well, again, this intersects with our fourth and final one, which is the intoxicating obsession with dividing Jerusalem under the banner of a two-state solution with Jews and so-called Palestinians living side by side in peace and security. This, of course, is 1 Thessalonians 5.3. Paul writing says, for while they are saying peace and security, and here's those two words that I believe we're going to be hearing a lot of in the year to come, sudden destruction. While they are saying peace and security, sudden destruction comes upon them. And here's that analogy again, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. The implication being they are not we. We are not they. I know that's deeply profound. We will escape. We will escape. In the great escape, the blessed hope, the only hope. And that's when that trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ rise first. And we who are alive and remain will be caught up. That's how we escape. We are the we. They are the they. They will not escape when the sudden destruction comes down. I truly believe and becoming increasingly convinced that when sudden destruction comes down, we go up. We go up. To which I say, bring it, bring it. Okay. To me, one of the most significant, if not the most significant prophetic developments in 2017 was the recent declaration by President Trump that Jerusalem is the eternal capital of Israel and that the United States is gonna move its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Um, I have to say, and you'll forgive the abrupt close here, but to me, this one 
development, this declaration, I believe, has set in motion the beginning to come to pass of Bible prophecy. And it's, again, the likes of which I don't think we've ever seen before now. We uh, are already hearing the rumblings, if I can say it that way, the threats that are coming as a result. And this came right at the end of 2017. So I want to close with a question with that in mind. The question on this, the eve of our countdown to 2018, as we say goodbye to a very interesting year in 2017. So here's the question. If so much has happened so fast in 2017, wouldn't it stand a reason that more will happen in 2018? And not only more will happen, but wouldn't it also stand a reason that it will also happen faster in 2018? You know, once the birth pains start, they don't stop. You're never going to have the doctor come into that room and say, you know what, um, I promised my staff a lunch today, so can you just hold off and then we'll, what, no, <laughs> I cannot. <laughs> Once they start, they don't stop. Not only do they not stop, they continue to increase in frequency and intensity and such is the case I believe with all that is happening let me if you don't mind take it one step further and ask this question wouldn't it also stand a reason that as Christians we would do well to get serious and be ready stop playing around stop playing church Wouldn't it stand a reason that it's now time for us to look up and lift up our heads knowing that our redemption draws nigh? You know what John said about this? He said that those who have this hope of his soon return purify themselves. You know what that means? They get their affairs in order. It's like if you go into the doctor's office and the doctor says, um, I've got some... Um, bad news. Uh, it's terminal. Uh, you don't have much time. You need to get your affairs in order. Uh, that's what we're talking about here. We need to get our affairs in order. One last question. And it's for those who have never called upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Here's the question in a word. Why? Are you kidding me? With everything that is happening in the world today, I'm not trying to be clever or cute or coy or anything. I'm just genuinely, why would you put it off? The most important decision you will ever make in your life for eternal life. If you'll just give me two more minutes, I want to share with you the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ by way of the ABCs of salvation. The A is for admit that you're a sinner and acknowledge your need for a Savior. Romans 3.10 says, there is no one righteous, not even one. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We were all born sinners, which is why we must be born again spiritually to see the kingdom of heaven. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. It's the death penalty. But, and this is the good news, the gift of God, <coughs> pardon me, 
is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The B is for believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is Romans 10, 9 and 10. It says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. And then the C, lastly, is for call, pardon me, upon the name <coughs> of the Lord. This is Romans 10, 9 and 10, which also says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And then lastly, this is what seals the deal, if you will. It says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I can't think of a better day and a better way than today, on this last day of 2017, to get right with God. Why don't you all stand and we'll pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much. Lord, I thank you as you said, as John records, that you're going to tell us what's going to happen before it happens. So when it happens, we'll believe. Well, Lord, we believe. And when believers who believe begin to see these things, come to pass, then Lord, it's time to look up and lift up our heads, knowing our redemption draws nigh. Could 2018 be the year that you return, Lord? Certainly could. And so, Lord, we would just simply pray, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. In Jesus' name, amen.